Children's games are almost always viewed as harmless fun for them to make friends and pass time. But did you know that some of these games or activities might cause some dire consequences? Well, I'm not talking about games like baseball or tag, of course. I know, every single activity had its own hazards. But none can be as troubling as hide and seek. And it's especially troubling if the kids that played it are good at it. As they can fit or hide in places anyone wouldn't even think of. Did you know that the average of missing people that are reported was hundreds of thousands every year? Well, I'm not saying that every single one of them went missing because of this game. But what I'm saying is that the game does contribute to the numbers to a certain degree. If the players gets too competitive, it may cause them to hide in hard to reach or otherwise places people wouldn't even think of. What's worse is when they're stuck in places they shouldn't be. No one will be able to find them. I know some adults still enjoy this activity. But most would agree that children are most likely to be the one playing hide and seek. Though I'm not sure about the exact numbers of missing children. But deep down, I'm sure the numbers are more than what was reported on the news. Make no mistake, I'm not an analyst. So the information I listed here may be inaccurate. My name is Kazu. I'm a priest of a small church in a rural town of Japan for 15 years now. I can't disclose any exact locations due to the privacy of the victim's family, so I'll leave it at that. Although we could be extremely busy at times. You know, our responsibilities like baptism, confirmation, listening to confessions, visiting the sick, and provide guidance to those that ask for help. But Japan is a country of Buddhism, so we get more breathing times compared to our fellow brethren in other countries. I'm 40 by the way, still considered young for a priest, so I do occasionally enjoy some of the stuff young people do. But nothing that will be considered a sin of course. Some as simple as watching movies and listening to podcasts. Well, that's one of the main reasons that led me to write my story here. I stumbled upon a podcast episode that is a documentary of a missing child. It brought back some horrifying memories in the past. To summarize that podcast episode, the child was playing hide and seek with his friends, but they never found him at the end of the day, only to discover his skeleton decades later in an abandoned electrical appliance room. The child couldn't get out because the rusted hinge and handle was stuck. They found his skeleton still curled in a fetal position. Hunger is the cause of death. Sad, isn't it? I can somehow relate to that story. Because I experienced something extremely similar 15 years ago when I was still an inexperienced priest. There's something I need to clarify before I get more into that. Although it's not spoken publicly. Those of us that work in this church have some abilities to a certain degree that normal people would call out of the ordinary. And by abilities, I mean spiritual ones. But it's nothing exaggerated like in the movies. And no, I'm not able to shoot spirit bullets out of my fingertips if that's what you're wondering. Sorry to disappoint you. One example is that most sisters, cleaners, or cooks that work in this church can actually send spirits. Some can hear them. Those higher in skills will be able to expel them. I, for one, has the ability to see them. That's why although it pains me to say it, I'm very hesitant when it comes to approaching people whose family, or even worse, whose children went missing especially when they come to me and seek of guidance for the worried heart. Because I would know what happened to their missing children before any of them. Then, I'll be forced to give them false hope. An example would be they might still be alive and still waiting for the search teams to find them. It especially pains my heart when I see the spirits of the lost children wailing beside their parents, trying to get the attention that will never come. I then will try to chant silently to appease their spirits and try to guide them to our Lord who will take them to the afterlife. You see, 
The reason I put so much emphasis that I'm more worried about the missing children is that, in most cases, if the worst case happened, the spirits who are adults are easier to appease and let go of their past lives because their minds have matured and had experienced life themselves. But when it comes to children's spirits, things would be different. Their immature minds are easier to manipulate and blinded by the impulses of their feelings. Thus, makes them harder to feel at peace, or, in other words, move on. It can be especially horrifying if left unresolved, as they can grow more malicious, thus become more of a curse who harms anyone than a normal spirit. Let's take you back 15 years ago when I just started working at the small church that I'm currently at. The sisters and the workers are very friendly, so I fitted in perfectly in just weeks. Although the church is large, but it isn't the main branch, so the mother reverend or the priest that are higher in ranking only visits occasionally. You see, our church has a nursery as well, so we do help parents take care of their children whenever they went to work. Free of charge, of course, but we do take any amount of donations if they're feeling generous. We provide tutoring, lunch, playtime and story time to the children. There's even a playground next to the church. In fact, I'm proud to say that within the span of weeks, I became one of their favorite people in the church other than Sister Sophia, as I'm the one that reads them interesting stories whenever I was free. The kids treat me like the big brother they never had. Things were pretty normal, until one morning, one of the kids, I'll call him Taka in this story, was dropped off by his parents. He and his parents just moved to this part of Japan, so he is quiet because of the new surroundings, but will play with the other kids if they invited him. He is adjusting pretty well, I guess. After his parents drove off, I saw a spirit of a boy that looked to be around the age of 10 next to him. Being able to see spirits when I was young, I wasn't faced by this. Just simply approached Taka and held his hand. One reason being to take Taka inside to join the other kids, while the other is to prevent the spirit from harming him if it turned out to be evil. While walking inside the church, I start a barely noticeable chant without letting Taka know, activating holy protection around the surroundings. After Taka and I reached the door, I passed him to one of the sisters and walked back to the gate to approach the boy spirit with a calm demeanor as to not aggravate it. Fun fact. Not all spirits are evil. Some of them just need help, and I always do what I can to help them so they can move on. I tried communicating with him by greeting, but no response was given. He just keeps staring at me with his blank eyes. I ask him, Hi there, is there anything I can help you with? No response. Usually, spirits will respond if they know you can communicate with them but it doesn't seem like the case for this one. Then I ask, Are you by any chance mute when you were alive? As some spirits carry over their characteristics from when they were alive. He gave me a nod. Okay, no problem with that. Just respond with a shake or a nod. I'll do what I can. He nodded again. I stayed in my thought for a short while as I was limited to the yes or no questions. Are you looking to be appeased? He shook his head. Can you write? He nodded. Can you write your name? He shook his head. You didn't know how to write it. He shook his head. That confused me for a few seconds. After a few minutes of thinking, I rephrased my words. Did you forgot your name? He nodded. Ah, so that's the case. Normally, I'll just chant a few incantations to appease the spirits and let it pass on. But one thing people didn't know is that you can only appease spirits that wanted it to happen. Otherwise, the other way is to brutally banish it from this realm, which can be torturous to spirits. To let you guys have a better understanding, I'll use a computer as an example. To appease the spirit and let it move on, 
is just like moving a file from one computer to a heavenly computer. To banish a spirit is like dragging the file into a recycling bin and hit delete, sending it to a mass nothingness for eternity. While exorcism is just simply cut off the connection between your computer and a hacker that is controlling it. There's a difference. Since he doesn't look like any harmful spirits, nor did he do anything bad, I didn't want to use this hostile method against him. I proceed to ask him, Are you looking for anyone in the church? He nodded. He was clearly talking about Taka. Does he know you? He shook his head. Why are you looking for him? You can write your answers on the pile of sand next to the gate. He floats to the pile of sand and wrote the word, Tomodachi, meaning friend in Japanese. I started to feel sorry for the spirit. He's simply lonely. But I'm afraid I can't let him approach the kids, as I didn't want to put any of them at risk. So I ask him, But the kids can neither communicate nor see you. How can you befriend them? He wrote on the sand with a sudden force before vanishing along with a huge gust of wind. I turned around, trying to spot him, but he was nowhere to be seen. I turned to look at the sand to see the word, Asobo. It means play in Japanese. Although it didn't do anything, I can't shake off the bad feeling I had. I keep my guard up around the church and pay extra attention to the kids. I let the sisters, cleaners, and cooks know about the strange encounter as well, and ask them to raise their awareness. Though I already placed protective seals to the church's surroundings, I can't protect the kids if they stepped out of the domain when their parents arrived after work. Some of you may say that I was exaggerating when this happened, but looking back, I'd say I wasn't careful enough. Although I can't give a straight answer to the parents when they return, because I didn't want them to mistake me for being insane, but I asked them to pay extra attention to their children, do not let them play outside even with friends, and ask them to bring their child back to the church if their child is doing anything weird like talking to themselves or acting strangely, especially with Taka's parents. When they ask for reasons, I just made up excuses like an inmate that is almost as scary as the killer Miyazaki. A truly terrifying case, look it up on Google, have escaped from prison, and to not let their child go anywhere unsupervised. I know, it isn't like a priest to make things up, but I had to for the kids. Things looked to be normal for a few weeks. We continued our schedule as usual. I just think of the spiritual encounter as a random occurrence and forgot about it. Until one day, while I was ready to read stories to the children. Oh, how they love story time, I tell ya. Whenever I walked into the playroom, one of them would scream, Big Brother Kazu was here, and just sat on the carpeted floor around my seat. This time, one of them was especially quiet. Taka. He was sitting at the corner of the room, just staring into the ceiling. I asked the other kids if Taka was okay, but they didn't know anything. Just simply said he ignored them since morning. I just calmly rest the storybook on the armchair and walked over to Taka. While I was already standing next to him, he didn't seem to notice me. Although everything seems normal, my intuition says otherwise. I make a small chant and press my finger right at the center of his forehead. A sudden image emerged from Taka's innocent face. It was the boy spirit. But this time, it's different. His face looked more demonic than last time, with pitch black eyes that are bleeding along with a set of sharp teeth like that of a shark. I have to admit, it gave me a jump scare. The spirit screamed, then it disappeared. Taka was back to normal again. The other kids asked me if I was okay because of my reaction just now. They didn't notice it, but I can't say anything. 
I didn't want to scare them. I made some excuse that there's an important meeting with the sisters and workers before I left the room. I asked the kid's most trusted sister, Sister Sophia, to take care of them while telling her the shortened version of my encounter. She was shocked, but she knows what she needed to do and walked into the playroom to take care of the children. She had the experience when it comes to dealing with evil spirits, so I'm not that worried about her. I called for an emergency meeting with all the church workers to inform them of the details. They were surprised. One of our cook, Mr. Hanamura, raised a good question. Normally, a spirit wouldn't even be able to enter this holy place. How is a spirit of a child able to enter, let alone possess one of the kids? We didn't have an answer. We just agreed on tightening our holy protection around the church, had a few extra sisters taking care of the children, and asked the cleaners and cooks to further raise their awareness around the church. We again notified every single one of their parents to be more careful of their children with a much more serious tone this time. Most people would ask me why didn't we temporarily stop the parents from leaving their children here. But here's the issue. All of them dropped their children here for a reason. They just simply don't have the time or money to hire other caretakers. And plus, the spirit manages to enter a holy domain and possess one of the kids. A place protected with holy seals. What makes you think other places are safer? So we have no other choice but to try and solve the problem. We spend the whole night trying to figure out who, what, and where the spirit is. But no answers can be found as we have not a single clue in the first place. Sister Sophia suggests looking at the church's records, as the church has been there for about 40 years at the time and has taken care of countless children before. So maybe there was a chance that the records of the boy spirit can be found. He was here for a reason. We agreed to temporarily excuse her from her duties, as the records may take days to even glance through half of them. As I'm the only person in this church with the ability to see spirits, and she didn't know what the spirit looks like, I asked her to sort out if there are any records of accidents to the children in the history of this church as a starting point. She then started her work in the office where the documents are stored. It's as big as a miniature library, so we wouldn't expect the results anytime soon. Some of the other sisters offered their help as well to make her job easier. We started to search around the church to see if there's any strange objects, ornaments, or, for the worst case, a body. We search almost everywhere. The rooms, the hallway, the playground, but nothing strange can be spotted. The next day, Sister Gabby and I approached Taka while he was playing with the other kids. I asked him whether he encounters or did anything strange the past few weeks as that's when I first saw the spirit with Taka. Taka stayed quiet for a moment, as if he was thinking about how to answer our questions. I fully understand that, as children can't remember everything they did, not to mention what they did weeks ago. But luckily, he did. He slowly pulled out a broken silver whistle, with a beautiful crest of an eagle at the center. I asked him where did he found it, and if anything weird had happened before he found it. He just said that during a windy day, he heard a crack in the church near the right narthex while he was playing with the kids. He went and checked it out alone, only to find a whistle in the corner. I guess one of the stained glass windows was worn down throughout the years. But we didn't think much of it, as the spirit was our main worry at the time. Taka hands over the silver whistle, then continue playing with his friends. Though I didn't have any proof, just a hunch that the whistle is tied to the spirit somehow. Sister Gabby and I then proceed to the office where Sister Sophia was in and help her with the search, as we didn't have much to do at the time. And most people didn't know this, but every being's name is a powerful seal to their body and soul. Especially when the spirit boy told me he'd forgotten his name. It's troubling because it means he's losing himself and is much more prone to become a cursed spirit. So, in order to appease the spirit if his consciousness is still there and wanted to find peace, or at the worst case, during a banishment rite, 
his name is needed, along with a personal object. But for a guaranteed banishment of an evil spirit from this realm, their body is an even better target. But a name is much more achievable in our situation back then, as we already had his personal item. After four hours of non-stop searching, Sister Gabby found it. The spirit boy's information. Sister Gabby didn't know what he looks like, but there's a black and white picture of him with the other children of the past, wearing that same silver whistle on his chest like a necklace. She called Sister Sophia and me over to verify, and I can confirm it. The face and the whistle, it's unmistakable. Due to reasons of privacy, I'll call the boy spirit Haru in this story. His information was pretty vague, as he wasn't actually under the care of this church. He disappeared around the period when the church was finishing their bill 40 years ago. So, this was more like a missing person report in my opinion. Haru was a mere 12 year old, and explained the whistle. He was last seen playing with his friends around the area. Guess what they were playing? Yeah, I'm sure you got it. It was hide and seek. I guess he won, as he was never found after that. We confirmed that after we consulted with a chief of our local police department. Even after 40 years, Haru was still listed as missing, and was presumed dead. Tragically, his parents had passed before anything can be solved. At around 7pm, after all the kids had left, all the sisters and I gathered around in our prayer room trying to use the whistle to summon Haru's spirit. As we didn't want any curious teenager trying this out, I won't be revealing the method. Please understand. We prepared for the worst of course, just in case if it has completely lost its sanity. We're ready to banish it there and then, as we can't simply risk it harming anyone. But Haru seems to know what we're trying to do. After hours of summoning right, Haru appeared. What's different is that, this time, all the sisters can see him. Unlike the demonic look it gave me last time, he looks like a normal spirit. But he is unable to hide the malicious aura around him. I started to communicate with Haru once again. Young spirit, your name is Haru. His eyes glittered for a moment. He was crying, but after a few seconds, he was holding his head like he had a headache, then went back to being expressionless. That's a bad sign. He has lingered on this realm for far too long that he was losing his sanity. He is on the verge of being consumed by his emotions. I quickly replied, hoping to catch on on his true self. Haru, I don't understand why you're doing this. Deep down, I know you're still looking to find peace, but why are you possessing the kid? A pan of sand we read it that is placed at the center of the prayer room suddenly has the word friend written on it. Domodachi. I replied, Haru, I know you're lonely, but a human child is incapable of befriending a spirit. It is not good for the child. Side note, if a spirit hangs near a human for too long, your life force will passively be absorbed by the spirit. It's especially dangerous to a child, as they have a weaker life force. In the worst case, it would render the child getting weak enough to be harmed even by everyday diseases. Haru, you have to move on. You're alone in the human realm for much too long, and you're being consumed by your emotions. You already found your identity. Please, let us help you. The sisters and I are ready just in case the spirit became hostile, clutching the silver cross in front of our chest tightly. I inch closer to the spirit with open arms, hoping for it to loosen up enough to trust me. I know, bad move, and I can tell you, it is. I speak with an extremely calm demeanor. Haru, I understand your pain and suffering. You don't have to be alone any longer. Let our Lord guide you to your next realm. Your mom and dad are already there waiting for you. Haru, 
I know you're still in there. Let us appease you. Please. The spirit looks blankly at me for a few minutes. Everything was silent. I saw a single tear drop from his right eye, signifying his last drop of sanity, I guess. Then suddenly, his blank expression turned sinister. His blank eyes turned pitch black, with red tears flowing out of it. His grin grew wide, brandishing his sharp teeth like before. We knew the answer, but as we're starting the banishment rite, it dashed towards the silver whistle with inhuman speed, taking it from the offering table we placed it on while generating an invisible force that blew me a few feet away, breaking a few wooden chairs at the side while I fall. Then it disappeared again. Smart. He already knows the whistle is a vital part of our right. We should have secured it even more back then. Now, our chance of finishing things then and there was gone. I was injured, obviously, with the fibula in my left leg broken, along with a few broken ribs. All of the sisters come over to help me, while one of them called the ambulance. I was fainting in and out due to the severity of the injuries. As the paramedics arrived in the prayer room and lifting me with the stretcher, I noticed another word written on the sand. Asobo. My eyes are getting weaker, but I still couldn't shake away the panic in my heart. He wants to play. With my last ounce of consciousness, I quickly grabbed Sister Sophia's right arm, telling her in a weakened voice, Please find Taka's parents immediately. He is in danger. Then, I blacked out. I didn't know the real reason Haru chose Taka as his target, but I can only theorize that because Taka is the first one that takes his whistle, and Haru treats it as a bond. I only found out how serious my injury was after I woke up. I was out for eight days because of head trauma. According to Sister Gabby who stayed by my side and taking care of me, I quickly ask her how's Taka. Sister Gabby's facial expression says it all. It doesn't take long until Sister Sophia herself came into my hospital room as it was her turn to take care of me. She shed a few tears as she saw that I have awoken. But a few seconds later, she turned into full-blown crying. I ask her to sit down in the chair next to my bed and calm her down. Sister Gabby poured her a hot drink, then sat on the other side of my bed. After about 10 minutes, when she had calmed down, Sister Sophia began telling me what happened after I was sent to the hospital. After the things I told her before I passed out, she immediately noticed what was written on the sand. She asked all sisters to gather at Taka's house. After they arrived, Taka's parents were still awake even though it's already midnight along with two police officers at the doorstep. Taka was already missing. His parents had gone to his room to check if he was asleep, only to find his futon empty, with a paper on top that wrote, Watashi o Mitsukenikide, which translates to, Come and find me. To shorten the story, Taka was never found. Even with the help of search teams, the police department, and our church. The sisters thought I will be in a coma for a long time, so the main church already sent a temporary priest and a few extra nuns to take care of the work. Both to lighten the sisters' work, and also so the sisters will be able to take turns taking care of me. I was able to get back to the church to continue my work after a few weeks, but the clutch is needed because of my broken leg. Even though it's been weeks since Taka disappeared, but the search team and police are still searching for him. I wanted to help, but with my injury still recovering, I'll only be a nuisance. The only thing I can do for Taka at the time was to pray to our Lord. After I was done praying in front of the altar, I can't help but just look back to the large room in the church behind my back, just to have some breathing time for my worried heart. While my mind idles, hoping Taka is safe, 
I looked up at the church's tall and sturdy wall full of windows with the art of our Lord. Something clicked in my mind. Although the whole building is very tall in terms of height, it has no second floors. Yes, we checked every hall, room, and surroundings of the church, but we never once checked above us. The sudden realization put me in a panic state. I quickly gathered the sisters, cooks, and cleaners to start the search again. It took hours. We looked up and down, but nothing out of the ordinary. Until we gather in front of the altar to discuss our results. A sudden memory popped in my head. I remember Taka said he found a whistle near the right narfax of the church. A grim feeling filled my heart. The sisters and helpers noticed my expression. I just walked to the far right of the church and looked up the windows above us. There it was. Beyond the many pillars that makes the top right window a blind spot. Resting at the corner on the wide and thick window stool was what looked to be a skull of a child. Haru was unaffected by the holy seals because he was already in them. I lifted my finger slowly, pointing at the location. After the sisters saw it, they couldn't help but cover their mouth. Understandable. A body was in here since the beginning, but no one ever noticed it. We asked for the help from the fire department, who then came and bring the skeleton of a child down. After they left, we quickly started the rite of summoning again, but this time with extra protection seals and charms, and with his main body already in the prayer room, Haru couldn't reject this invitation because he appeared rather quickly. I asked him to reveal Taka's location, hoping that his main consciousness was still there hoping he would do the right thing one last time. But all we get was a devilish laugh. Uh, uh, uh. It's, it's against the rules. rules. You would just have to find him. <laughs> <laughs> That's when we realized Haru was beyond saving. He was so far gone that he was able to use his malicious energy to generate speech. I then put my final touch on Haru's skull to banish him completely. He let out a wail full of pain, then dissipated into the air around us. We gave Haru a proper burial in the cemetery after. That's how it ended. Taka was never found and was presumed deceased. Throughout the past 15 years, I still blame myself for not realizing that any quicker. Taka's outcome was preventable if we just figure things out a little bit faster. As for how Haru ended up on the top right window of the church in the first place, I have my own theory for that. 55 years ago, when the church was finished building, the area was pretty secluded. There's no way of preventing anyone from sneaking in. Haru and his friend decided to play hide-and-seek in the playground a little farther from the church. Then Haru became competitive. He decides to go a bit further out of their play zones and found a church. He found one of the tall ladders inside that led to one of the top window stools near the narthex. He climbed up and sit there, waiting to win the game, but he fell asleep while doing so. Unknowingly, one of the builders came and removed the ladders without knowing a kid is up there and left. When Haru woke up after a while, he panicked, trying to call for his friends, but he can't. He's too far out that they couldn't hear the sound he makes. The whistle he had is already broken, so there's no way to make any signal to others. The church wasn't officially open yet, so no one would come to this area around that time. Right after Haru's friend reported his disappearance, the search team is still finding him, not knowing he's a little farther. After days, Haru was getting desperate. In his weakened state, he used the last ounce of his energy trying to break the window with his whistle, but can only chip part of it, 
causing that part to be the weakest link that was blown off by the strong wind 40 years later. Then Taka heard a small crack near the narthex and found his whistle that fell down. Nobody noticed his body throughout the years, as the window hasn't been serviced or cleaned ever since it was built. Plus, it was in a blind spot where you can only notice at a certain angle and place in the church. His spirit was roaming around the church, accumulating dark energy, filled with fear, loneliness, and regret. The church's workers didn't see him because they didn't have the ability to, so it's pretty understandable. But I couldn't explain why I didn't notice him until that day when I saw Taka at the gate. Maybe he's been avoiding me the first few weeks I worked there. And that when Taka took his whistle, it finally broke him. The news reported Taka's disappearance as missing while playing. But we know the truth. That is why I banned the kids from ever playing hide-and-seek in my church. It's troublesome. And though it's not the main reason Taka went missing, it's undeniable that the chain reaction cost the life of another boy. It's been 15 years since Taka disappeared now. But lately, I started to notice his spirits in the corner of my eyes. It disappeared whenever I tried to look at it directly. But I caught a glimpse that there's a silver whistle in front of his chest now. Seeing his spirit here means a few things. Either someone found his personal items, or someone triggered him. I'm afraid the cycle will start soon. But this time, the biggest problem is, Taka's body could be anywhere. We couldn't scale down the search like Haru's case, as there was no clue. That is why, after I listened to the podcast episode, I've decided to write my story here, informing all of you. Though, you can't do anything about the spirit, but you can prevent the game from ever creating another spirit like Haru. So please, don't let your child play hide and seek. <laughs>